Hi, um, my name is Dr. Kate Huntsman, and I'm here today uh, to participate in this CME discussing the importance of choosing the right biologic for adult deformity surgery. Um, again, Kate Huntsman, I am a partner at the Solid Orthopedic Clinic. Um, I've been there for about 20 years now. I'm the chief of surgery at St. Mark's Hospital, and I am also the chief of a group of spine centers called the Comprehensive Spine Centers, where we manage uh, patients in all phases of their spine care. I'm an orthopedic spinal surgeon, and in my practice, I participate in degenerative spine conditions, scoliosis, some spinal trauma. Uh, I do a lot of cervical work, disc replacements. I do a lot of lateral approaches, particularly for my deformed work. And then some MIS approaches, all of my posterior screws in non-deformity cases are placed through MIS approaches and robotic surgery. But for the larger scoliosis and kyphosis type procedures, those are done mostly open in my practice. Here are my disclosures. And uh, this is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP global company, and it is supported by an educational grant from BioVentus. Our learning objectives today are to examine bone graft choices made for deformity where large volumes of graft are being used, mixed, and relied upon for fusion, and to explore the science and mechanism of action of bone grafting, what is packed into the cage, the type and of handling and surface area needed. Uh, we'll examine the role of bioactive bone grafts in strip format or in putty format as a viable option for the posterolateral fusions, and we'll investigate the efficacy and cost effectiveness of a premium allograft when a more potent biologic is needed. So as we talk about spinal deformity, I felt like it would be appropriate to discuss um, some of the types of deformity we're talking about. And of course, deformity can be in the cervical spine, it can be in the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, or of course, most commonly, um, all of the above. Um, so we're gonna talk today a little bit about scoliosis, kyphosis, lordosis, rotational deformities, um, and deformities that are a little bit more simple, such as spondylolisthesis and retrolisthesis and, and how they play a role in bone graft choices. Um, balancing the spine in these patients is very, very important. That's the purpose of the procedure. So we're trying to balance it, not just in one plane, but in every plane. And so that allows for the patient to have better biomechanics as they're up and about walking. It generally requires less um, energy and they get less fatigue. And of course they have less pain as well. So on this slide, we have you know, three of the common types of deformities. The first image there is just a very mild scoliosis, but you can see how one curve will oftentimes have a secondary curve to correct it so that the patient um, is centered over their pelvis. Uh, essentially, the head um, and neck should be over the pelvis in all planes. The second image there is a very common deformity, flat back deformity or kyphosis. And that can be caused by poorly done surgery or just the aging process. So we do see some flat back deformities in patients who have had um, less than perfect outcomes after a surgery. And we also see it in patients who just age. And as we all age, we tend to tip forward. And then a sway back, which really uh, is just an excessive lordosis, something we don't see as much, but something that definitely is of concern when we're considering deformity surgery. I included this slide because this just shows all of the above. This is a 3D reconstruction of a younger patient's spine um, with severe scoliosis. Um, this patient has a lot of rotation thoracolumbar lumbar curve that's quite dramatic. And you can see the reconstruction of the ribs. And so it's important to think about on this slide, when we're looking at fusing something like this posteriorly, we'll talk about this as we go through, but we can fuse those ribs together. We can fuse the transverse processes that you see at the lower part of that image. We can fuse things in the interbody space. I like to correct deformities with anterior approaches or lateral approaches so that my posterior pedicle screw construct doesn't have to support as much. 
And so that brings in a whole different set of comments and topics about interbody grafting. So we'll talk about that as well, but this is just a slide to remind us all that we're talking about a multiplanar deformity when we're talking about deformity surgery. This is a patient of mine who had a minimally invasive two-level fusion. Um, he was kyphotic before that uh, surgery. He was much more kyphotic after that surgery and he, he flew out to see us to get this corrected. And this is the type of, of problem that we see when we don't do the appropriate surgery. And this patient also went on to a pseudarthrosis at one of those two levels. So he had a more significant problem. He simply cannot stand up straight. And you can imagine how much pain this causes by him being hunched over so much. So as he's trying to walk around, he's either looking at the floor as he's doing there, or patients will oftentimes almost go into a seated position to get their trunk and neck and head facing forward better, but then they're really burning a lot of quad musculature because they're trying to hold themselves in a seated position as they walk. And you'll see them alternate back and forth between those two postures at times. And this can just be a devastating problem. So as we talk about deformity in all different planes, kyphosis is one that we really need to pay a lot of attention to. It's one that used to be overlooked a lot. It's a hot topic the last few years and it should be something we never forget about in the future. So adult spinal deformity, we talk about you know, when we should operate, what are the indications for these patients? And the list of indications can be extremely long, but some of the general broad categories are, we're gonna operate on somebody that has pain, that has a functional loss, occasionally for cosmesis, uh, we do it a lot for uh, prevention of progression. We don't want the deformity to continue to fall over over time. And so as we worry ourselves about this, particularly in thoracic scoliosis cases where chest cavities can be compressed, lungs can be compressed, even the, the heart can be compressed at times. And so we have to focus um, on each patient as an individual. And as we go through this to talk today, we will also discuss why bone graft varies in each of those different situations as well. I think the most important thing to remind anybody about when we're talking about deformity surgery is that we really have to do a good job of educating the patients and educating their support systems as well. Um, this is an extended recovery. The procedure could be very morbid. Even with minimally invasive techniques, this is a big, big surgery for patients. And a lot of the patients that have this problem are elderly and um, don't have the same reserves that perhaps a younger pediatric scoliosis patient might have. And so it's really important to educate the patient so that they can make the appropriate decision. So the goals of adult spinal deformity surgery are to safely correct the deformity. If that's kyphosis, we need to pull them back and realign them if they have scoliosis or rotation, we have to derotate that as much as possible in a safe manner and straighten that scoliosis out in a safe manner. All of these things will help improve their pain as well as their biomechanics. Um, and again, each time we talk about a different type of procedure, I'm going to talk about a different type of bone graft for that procedure. Here, we also need to remember that as we decompress, sometimes there are neural structures uh, nerve roots in the spinal cord that may limit how much correction we can get. Um, and so we may have to do some decompressions as well. And essentially we talk about posterior approaches for deformity correction that include osteotomies. And a lot of times those osteotomies are done, one, to correct the bony deformity, but two, also simultaneously to uh, decompress the neural structures so that the deformity correction does not cause compression. There are many different surgical approaches uh, to the thoracolumbar spine and cervical spine uh, in these deformity surgeries. We can approach the spine through an anterior approach. My preferences at the L45 and L5S1 level is to go anteriorly so I can place a large interbody spacer and correct deformity. This could even be a hyperlordotic cage. Um, cages nowadays are being built patient specific so we can correct deformity better. Uh, so 
for me in my hands, I do a better job at correcting deformity at the L5S1 level through an anterior approach. At the L4-5 level, oftentimes I will go either anteriorly or laterally, depending on the patient's anatomy and depending on the rest of the procedure as well. If everything above that is lateral, then I'm probably going to do 4-5 lateral as well. Um, if I'm doing 5-1 and I have to be anteriorly anyway, and L4-5 is easy to get to anteriorly, we'll approach it that way. A lot of my deformity work is done in the, the mid-thoracic and upper lumbar spine. And in those areas, I prefer to go lateral, again, to help me correct the deformity prior to placing the pedicle screws posteriorly. And then, of course, posteriorly, we place pedicle screws, and that can essentially be done at all levels of the spine. I talked a little bit about deformity correction using osteotomies as well, and those are primarily done posteriorly, although they can be done uh, at times through other approaches as well. Typically, when we're doing an extensive scoliosis or kyphosis deformity procedure, um, we're going to use a combination of approaches. We might go anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly in the same patient. And each of those approaches require different types of bone grafts if we're going to optimize our bone graft choices. Again, here are the surgical approaches, the anterior lumbar interbody fusion, very common procedure done at the lower levels of the spine. It's a direct anterior approach. It's either transperitoneal, so through the abdomen, or it's retroperitoneal, meaning we go in the retroperitoneal space and stay out of the actual abdomen. Um, a lateral approach is something I prefer to do. That can either be anterior to the psoas muscle or trans psoas. There is an oblique approach to the lumbar spine as well that allows us to stay anterior to the psoas muscle. And then of course, posteriorly. If you look to the image on the right there, B, that shows you the structural anatomy that's also going to be of concern. So you can see the bottom right arrow there, a lift arrow shows the L5-S1 disc space and how easy it is to access from an anterior approach. But then you can see L4-5 directly above that with a vein and artery overlying it that becomes much more difficult to approach. From a lateral approach, we worry about the lumbar plexus inside the psoas muscle. And so the lower we are, the more plexus there is and the more anterior it tends to be. And so that might limit our approach to this level as well. So keep in mind multiple different approaches and oftentimes the different approach implies a different bone graft choice should be made. Now this is a very complicated slide, but it's very important. When we're talking about the right biologic, there's essentially three very broad categories of biologics. There's the autograft and in my training, autograft was considered the gold standard. Autograft though, if you look at a young, healthy pediatric scoliosis patient, that bone quality and their ability to heal is dramatically different than an elderly patient with a kyphoscoliosis from degenerative disc disease. Uh, their bone quality is not nearly as good. So as bone quality varies patient to patient, we need to keep that in mind and not always make the assumption that autograft is going to be the best choice. It's not the gold standard in all patients. Allograft is a second type of graft. This means it's coming from a cadaver. Um, this is typically human tissue, and it can be processed in many ways, and we'll discuss those uh, here in a few minutes. And then synthetics, and I'll just let the cat out of the bag now. I'm a big fan of synthetics. I'm a big fan of synthetics because basically every potential factor involved in the synthetic can be controlled. Whereas autograft, we're patient dependent and allograft is harvesting dependent and allograft bone can come from variable sources, some good, some not good. And I'll share a personal experience about allograft bone later. But the bone graft material needs to be doing four things. We may not need all four of these depending on the patient situation and the place we're placing the graft, but Primarily, you want to see a bone graft that's going to allow for angiogenesis or the development of new blood vessels. We want the angiogenesis so that it can bring the appropriate cells and it can bring the appropriate materials for the bone to grow. We talk about bone graft materials being osteoconductive, and that simply means that it serves as a scaffold. 
So it's essentially the, the railroad tracks that the bone growth is going to follow. So a bone graft that has osteoconduction isn't going to attract any cells by osteoinduction, but it's going to allow those cells to have a place to sit and bind. Osteoinduction then implies that we're recruiting cells and stimulating local immature cells to become osteogenic cells. That might be osteoblasts or osteoclasts. Um, and that osteoinduction can be very, very powerful. That's what BMPs typically do is become very osteoinductive. And so that's a very important part of this bone healing cascade as well. And then ultimately the goal here is osteogenesis, which is just simply the formation of bone. And again, a combination of these three things is required for that. And our bone graft and actually our implants as well can participate in each of these depending on which graft we choose. So again, a very busy slide, but a very important concept to understand, which I think most of us understand, but sometimes forget to start, take the time while we're seeing a patient and think about these things so that we can choose materials more appropriately. Osteoinduction is, again, the recruitment of immature cells, the stimulation of these cells to develop into pre-osteoblasts and begin the osteogenesis process. This osteoinduction is affected by the surface topography of the material that we're talking about. So it can be affected by the ability of the cells to adsorb or adhere to the material. If the material is hydrophobic or hydrophilic, that plays a very significant role. Cells cannot bind to hydrophobic structures well. And so oftentimes a hydrophobic material will be walled off with fibrous tissue, whereas a hydrophilic material is more likely to be able to participate in the, in the fusion process. And then the inflammatory response of the material the inflammatory response is very important because of the material porosity and its size. The particle size, if too small or just inappropriately sized, can actually cause a massive inflammatory reaction. And so it's important to consider that as well. The inflammatory response is actually part of the bone healing cascade, but an excessive amount of inflammation uh, leads to macrophages being recruited and debris being cleaned up and that debris might actually be the bone graft that you're trying to use. So I think most graphs now understand the size of the materials matter and manage that size very well, but it's important to keep in mind that that can be an issue. Osteoconduction, again, this is just the scaffold for the bone to grow on. Osteoconduction is simply the ability of those bone forming cells to move across the scaffold and then to replace the scaffold with new bone over time. Osteoconductive materials serve as a scaffold for the bone cells. So these are the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts and it allows them to attach to it and then to migrate along it and then to grow and divide. So it actually can contribute to um, the mitogenic ability of these cells as the local mediators tell the cell to divide, the cell can then divide, and the new cell has a place to set down and begin performing its function. So it's very important for this osteoconductive process to be um, part of the bone healing cascade. And then angiogenesis, which we've mentioned a couple of times now, this is the ability of new blood vessels to be formed. This is done because of chemical signals in the bone healing bed, and these new blood vessels supply the nutrition for osteogenesis, supply the cells for osteogenesis, supply the materials that are needed for this bone healing, um, this cascade that we're trying to get to achieve. And then again, osteogenesis simply is the formation of the bone. And it does require a very tightly controlled and regulated microenvironment and macroenvironment. And by that, I mean the signaling molecules at the microenvironment are important. A little bit more of a macroenvironment might be the stabilization with rods and screws to or bracing to help hold a patient in place so that the fusion has a better chance to heal because of its stability. And then of course, in this osteogenic fusion bed, we're hoping for osteoinduction, conduction, and angiogenesis to help form the osteoid, which then gets calcified and becomes mature bone over time. And it's important to always remember that bone turnover is constant. Your bone is always being turned over due to the osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity that includes in your fusion bed.
Um, the biologics, we'll switch gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, some of the allografts that are available. So commercially available allografts are used in the majority of spinal fusion surgeries. These commercially available allografts come from many different sources. Traditional bone allografts and DBMs may lose their endogenous growth factors during the processing. So as you're studying bone graft materials, you might choose to use one of the questions to ask yourself and to research is whether or not this graft has been processed to the point of complete sterility. So there is no potential for infection, but in that processing, did they also lose all of the endogenous growth factors? So osteoinduction might not be part of this material property. And so the processing and how it's processed is very important. Newer processing techniques can actually make it uh, so it's a sterile product and maintain endogenous growth factors. So it's important to keep in mind that not all allografts are equivalent and we really do need to do our homework. Just because it comes in a, a pretty bottle doesn't mean the material inside is consistent and it does not mean that it's been tightly controlled in the processing steps. And one company's processing is gonna be very different than another's. And a lot of that is patented and so we need to make sure that we're using a company that's processing techniques don't destroy the actual product that we're trying to use. And this slide here almost gives me a headache just looking at it because it's so complex and so poorly understood by me. But what's important to see here is that this is a very complex uh, situation and each of these variables interact with the others. So when we're looking for angiogenesis, here's a list of molecules that stimulate angiogenesis in a positive or negative way. Mitogenesis, so the ability for these cells to divide, are affected by a different group of molecules, but these molecules have a lot of overlap as well. And then chemotaxis, or the ability for molecules to signal cells to come to this area, very important part of this cascade. And then osteoinduction, and these are primarily the BMPs that were mostly familiar with that causes osteoinductive property. Uh, so as you study biologics, um, it's important to remember that it's extremely complex and I don't think any of us understand it fully. I don't think any of us ever will understand it fully, but it's important to remember how complex it is and to understand it well enough that you can make adequate patient decisions. So here's just a quick slide to show my personal journey across the biologics over the last 20 years. So during my training, it was primarily autograft that was considered to be the gold standard. So the gold standard autograft, as I stated earlier, uh, if it comes from a pediatric patient, it's probably very high quality bone. If it's coming from an elderly patient, it's probably bone that's been replaced with a lot of fatty tissues and probably doesn't have the same ability to heal or to provide osteoinduction and osteoconduction, such as you would see in a younger patient's bone. So autograft is variable, um, dramatically variable. And so I personally don't think it's the gold standard anymore. It might be in certain situations, but certainly not in all situations. During my practice then, I evolved towards allograft, particularly in the beginning, uh, tricortical allograft for ACDF procedures in the neck. And these were quite successful. One of the problems is that the bone doesn't heal, it can resorb, and when it resorbs, you might get disc height collapse, and you might get some recurrent foraminal stenosis from the bone being resorbed. So they're not ideal in all situations, they're not perfect in all situations, but they're very, very useful. My personal bias against allograft began about 15 or 20 years ago in private practice, my first two or three years in practice, um, I received contaminated bone and implanted it in two separate patients. And then I followed those patients for quite some time, years afterwards, looking for signs of HIV, hepatitis, because the bone graft, allograft had not been processed appropriately, it hadn't been harvested appropriately, and it was potentially contaminated. Fortunately for my two patients, we had no issues, but it was a learning experience and pretty frightening for both me and the patients. And so I do have a slight bias. It's important to know that because of that early experience with allograft. Now I still use allograft a fair amount, but I do think about how it was processed and why I'm using it before I choose it. And then later I began using the cellular based products 
I did a small white paper for a company many, many years ago before these cellular products were really on the market. And um, we had some success with that. And I've used some of the brand names or Trinity and OsteoCell and so forth. We used those for a while. They kind of became very expensive and not a lot of great science behind them in the early days. And then of course, Infuse, which we've all heard during this transition to these other bone grafts, I also started transitioning to more peak type cages. And we'll talk in a little bit about why cage choice plays a role in your bone graft choice as well. Uh, so I moved from autograft towards allograft towards more cellular based products and then onto synthetics. And again, the reason that I find myself preferring synthetics is because the ability to control all aspects of the product. Um, we don't have to worry about infections with it. We don't have to worry about whether or not it's a good quality autograft or a bad quality autograft. It's very tightly controlled and maintained. So I think synthetics are the direction that most people are headed and it's someplace that I think we should be headed. One of the things we concern ourselves with in bone grafting is autograft. Um, as I've talked about, autograft may or may not be the gold standard depending on the surgery that you're doing, depending upon the patient that you're treating and their bone quality. But as you're doing a procedure, oftentimes we need to do a laminectomy. As you're removing laminectomy bone, of course it makes sense to clean that bone and process it and use that uh, for your bone graft bed. So recycling laminectomy that's being removed is typically a good idea in my opinion. Also, if you don't feel like you need the tension band effect from the spinous processes and interspinous ligament, then it's appropriate to harvest those spinous processes, clean them thoroughly, and uh, use that bone for uh, your fusion bed as well. I joke with my techs all the time when I have them do this to first off, make sure that they get it cleaned up adequately so we're not just regrafting uh, ligament that's been mixed in with this bone, but we're actually getting good quality bone. And they usually don't like to have to do this. It's a painful process at the back table, picking all the soft tissue off of it. But if it's done well, it's good, it's good bone and it can be very helpful. They also have um, some machines that will chop this up for you, almost like a food processor at the back table. So it's a little bit less onerous, but you still have to make sure you just put bone in that and not all the ligament and associated muscular tissue that might be attached to that bone. And then autografting from a remote site is something that I used to do a lot early in my career, and I almost never do it now. It increases the morbidity. You have a remote site that could potentially become infected. So it's a secondary potential site of infection. It's a secondary potential site for pain. Typically bone graft harvesting from a pelvis is a very painful procedure. Um, and so we have to keep those things in mind as well. It's still appropriate in certain settings, but I think with the good quality synthetics we have now that it's not really necessary in my practice uh, very often, if at all. Again, I'm gonna make the argument that some would claim that autograft is the gold standard. I don't believe that it is the gold standard except in a rare patient, but I think because patient bone quality varies so greatly, we need to keep that in mind and not just make assumptions that autograft is always better because it's not. We talk about this allograft as well. So allograft typically comes from a donor bone. How it's prepared is important. There are quite a few dramatic variations in the quality. Quite honestly, it's not very tightly controlled. So quality variations can be broad. It, does include a risk of disease transmission, which I described earlier uh, during my early career experience where I had two patients who went through this very scary period of time in their lives because of the potential of HIV or hepatitis risks. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Those risks are probably much smaller now than they used to be, but some of the processes to treat the bone may remove the angiogenic and osteoinductive abilities of the bone as well. So as they Reduce disease transmission. Some of those processes may require additional materials to be added to your bone graft to reinforce the angiogenic and osteoinductive capabilities of the bone. And then of course, synthetics, which are my preferred pathway most of the time. And there's many different types of synthetics, uh, calcium sulfate, calcium phosphate, all the ceramics, which we use a lot of, which is uh, things such as beta tricalcium phosphate, hydroxyapatite, bioactive glass, which has been um, growing quite a bit in the market. Uh, 
And then uh, some older products such as PLA, polylactic acid, which um, many years ago, they were making some inner body cages and screws and things out of this material because it can be replaced with bone. I would not consider it a bone graft material, but it's something that can act as a scaffold for bone, but I think it's probably run out its course. I don't know that it's used much anymore. Um, so the synthetics, the reason that I prefer these synthetics is because of these advantages. First, there's no increased morbidity from a harvest site. So no secondary pain, no secondary site of potential infection. These are sterile products. They're tightly controlled in their processing. And so there's really no disease transmission. It would be incredibly rare, if not impossible for that to occur. It's got an unlimited availability. So you're not relying on allograft bone, which may come from a, a poor quality donor. It may be unavailable at the time because of supply issues. And then again, with synthetics, you can control for the surface characteristics. You can control what synthetic is in the material. You can control for the porosity of the material. You can control for the particle size. Pretty much everything that you need to control, you can control in a synthetic bone graft production process. The reason that I keep saying that implants are important, I want to make this point to everyone because your implant can either participate in the fusion or it can inhibit your fusion. Peak is something that I still use to this day sometimes, not to the extent I used to, but peak is very hydrophobic. It's polyether ether ketone. And because it's hydrophobic, it does not participate in the fusion. It typically gets walled off with uh, fibrous tissue because the osteoblasts and osteoclasts cannot bind to the surface because of its hydrophobic nature. Um, porous peak was developed to try to improve these characteristics. And that porous peak allows for interdigitations of the bone into the peak cage, but it does not still allow the bone cells to actually bind to the surface of the peak and, and allow for that uh, process to be improved. So then they came out with uh, HA impregnated peak that may improve the process as well but the HA is what's participating in the fusion, not the rest of the peak structure. Um, so that might be an improvement. Porous peak might be an improvement, but essentially peak is a structural device. We need structural devices to hold disc spaces apart and to correct deformities, but it does not participate in the fusion and the fusion then has to occur either around the implant or through the center of the implant if it's, whole, if it's got a hole in the middle. But otherwise, the structure itself is there for structural purposes only, and it certainly does not participate in the fusion. So when we're choosing the right implant, titanium is one of the choices that I make. Titanium is something that will participate in the fusion, unlike uh, peak. So even smooth titanium with a smooth surface is an improvement over peak for the fusion bed. The Osteoblasts and osteoclasts will bind to smooth titanium. They actually bind to roughened titanium even better. And when I say roughened, I don't mean the rough texture that you feel between your fingers, but the microscopic uh, roughness. So in providing titanium implants with the appropriate surface coatings, these can be things that are added to the surface, uh, such as HA coatings. You can do subtractive techniques, such as acid or base etching to remove uh, some of the material from the titanium and leave little pits and spicules of titanium that interact directly with the cells. And so the, they can bind to the surface of this product. This is a hydrophilic product. 3D printing also allows us to control for stiffness of the implant and to vary the surface topography as well. Currently, 3D printing does not go down to the 10 to the minus ninth level of resolution, which we would need to print the surface even better than it currently is, but it certainly is getting better every year. And you can print and then acid etch or base etch or add something to the surface to get a very nice surface that bone cells will bind to. Uh, so 3D printing and titanium, I think are great options for, for inner body materials that then allow us to perhaps choose a less expensive graft if the cage is participating in that fusion. Um, also, 3D printing allows for less titanium. One of the reasons we don't like titanium is post-imaging. If a patient has a leg pain, perhaps after a fusion, and you want to look at the nerve root on an MRI scan, the shadow cast by the titanium may inhibit that. 
but the shadow that's cast by that titanium in a 3D printed model, there's much less titanium. When there's much less titanium, it doesn't scatter as much. You can see the nerve root better. So as we use less and less titanium in the actual cage, that imaging issue becomes better. And again, I will repeatedly say bone loves titanium. Um, I also want to just make the point that modulus is a material property. So uh, the argument for peak and against titanium is the modulus argument, but modulus has nothing to do with the actual argument. Modulus is a material property. It can't be changed. The modulus of peak is the modulus. The modulus of titanium is the modulus. Those numbers don't change. What we actually should concern ourselves with is the stiffness or the ability of an implant to deform under load. So if we put an interbody implant that's 3D printed titanium into the disc space, the 3D printing can actually control how stiff that material is and allow for some compression of the implant, even to have a more improved stiffness than a peak product. So this is a, a unique concept to try to remember that um, the stiffness of the implant is what matters and the stiffness is a design not material property. The right biologic requires us to know where we're sticking the biologic. So if we're gonna place the graft in a fusion model where we require some kind of structural integrity, that's gonna be a completely different graft than a DBM powder perhaps. So a structural requirement, you know, that might be a tricortical allograft in the neck, that might be a femoral strut graft in the lumbar spine, but that's a completely different type of graft uh, than the general grafts that we, we typically use. Currently, I think most surgeons use implants for structural integrity, and then grafting is in addition to that. However, sometimes we do require grafts that are structural. So if you're gonna place the graft in an interbody space with an implant or without an implant, uh, that's a completely different fusion bed. If we're going to try to do a posterior transverse process fusion, if you remember from that CT scan 3D reconstruction, we saw there's a pretty big gap from one transverse process to the other. And with that big gap from one TP to the other TP, we have to bridge that gap. So the material that we use has to be very powerfully osteoconductive to allow that jump to occur. It's also got to be osteoinductive to bring the cells that we need to that area. So you need a more powerful biologic if you're going to do an intertransverse process fusion than you may need if you do an interlaminar fusion. An interlaminar fusion means we're jumping from one lamina to the next, which is a very small jump, whereas the TP jump is very large. So that might play a role in your graft choice as well. I personally use a similar graft for transverse processes and the interlaminar fusions which are typically strip allografts, which we'll talk about here in just a second, uh, they tend to stay in place better than a putty. They stay in place better than any kind of a powder or mixture such as that. So the procedure being performed and the patient's bone quality and age and overall morbidities all play a role in what graft we choose. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we don't just choose the same graft for everyone. Inside a cage, you can think about it like this. It's usually in a contained space. That means the cage itself will hold the graft in place for you and allow bone healing process to happen through the center of the cage. Also, oftentimes we'll paste bone graft behind the ALL, the anterior longitudinal ligament in the disc space and we'll allow the ALL to contain it and then place cages behind it. So inside the disc space, particularly inside of a cage, that's a much more tightly contained space than just free floating between transverse processes in the back. And so because of that, there's no structural requirement. The cage is performing that. You have a large surface area and you typically have more cancellous bone because you're dealing with a vertebral body fusion instead of a hard cortical transverse process fusion with very little cancellous bone in it. So these inside of a cage interbody fusions require a very different material than a posterior fusion bed. The posterior fusion bed again, TP to TP, that's something that I'm gonna to wanna to graft in a strip format. I'm gonna want that so that I've got the scaffold to jump the gap. I want the scaffold, so the osteoconductive ability. I also want some osteoinductive ability because such a large gap to jump, I wanna make sure that I bring materials to the middle section of that jump, uh, not just get a fusion to the TPs, but actually have that bridge occur. And then an interlaminar fusion, we've talked about that's a very similar process. 
only a much smaller gap to jump. Now, we work in an environment now where uh, cost effectiveness is a very powerful thing. It's something that as physicians, we all should concern ourselves with. Less powerful, I'm going to just speak in very broad terms, but less powerful graphs are generally less expensive graphs. Those types of graphs can be used more successfully in a younger patient with good quality bone, in shorter constructs with fewer levels, and in a combined interbody and posterior fusion model where you've got more than one area where you're able to get your fusion. I will state, so I think most of us understand that if you get good solid interbody fusion, oftentimes your posterior fusion material resorbs. If you don't have an interbody fusion, then oftentimes your posterior fusion becomes very robust because as a reminder, bone does respond to stresses and it's constantly in turnover. And so a stressed bone is going to grow thicker and more healthy. So a posterior fusion model without an interbody is typically very much more robust than a solid interbody fusion and the subsequent posterior fusion may or may not be resorbed. When we talk about cost effectiveness, um, my role is as the patient advocate and I out my patient, I try to do the right thing for my patient every time. I'm going to be at odds with the payers often. If you look at a pseudarthrosis model, a pseudarthrosis and a revision surgery is a very expensive thing. That may be avoided if we use better, more premium allografts initially. That's going to cost less in the long term because we're going to avoid a revision fusion for a pseudarthrosis. However, an insurance company typically works in a shorter span than the patient's lifetime. So if you look at the hospital, the hospital is going to look at the cost effectiveness in essentially a 90 day period of time. After 90 days, they're outside of the global period. If something goes wrong, it's very likely that the insurance will pay for that. But if so, so a hospital focuses on 90 day or shorter costs. Insurance companies look at a, a patient's life and make the calculations based on this particular patient will probably be in our coverage for X number of years. So they're worried about patients for a little bit longer term, but generally it's for the remaining of their current contract, which is going to be less than a year because we all renew our insurances yearly. So they're gonna want something much less expensive initially. They may just pay in a bundled format in which all the onus then becomes on the hospital. But eventually this trickles back to the patient and we're trying to focus on the patient. So from a cost effectiveness standpoint, don't forget that it might be more beneficial to spend more money now to avoid a pseudarthrosis later. So again, be your patient's advocate. So again, I keep mentioning these, these strips. I think the strips tend to be better in posterior fusion beds. They can be augmented if you think they need to be with PRP or with bone marrow. Not something I do very often, but rarely. And these strips tend to stay contained better than the putty does. So all of these materials require carriers. They're not generally not uh, pure fusion material. The carriers can uh, dilute the graft. They can dilute the fusion material. They're important because they can help keep the graft contained, keep it where it's supposed to be. But by doing so, they might become inflammatory as well. So a carrier is a very important part of a graft. These strips, the carriers tend to be better carriers in terms of they stay there longer. If you use a bone putty, some the carrier might resorb within 24 hours, in which case you're left with a soup of graft material that might float away and just go wherever. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, the carrier plays a very important role. And in my experience, strips tend to do a much better job at staying where I put them or just chips of graft. So strips are important in these long posterior constructs. Probably not necessary in the interbody space because the cage will play the role of that carrier. Putty, in my opinion, tends to be better in the interbody space because the putty, typically the carrier resorbs more quickly the cage will help it to maintain its position. It won't allow it to leak out. Um, the inner body space itself will help to contain the material. It's moldable so you can fill the cage up fully. And then again, as I stated, it generally resorbs faster than chips. So you want to put it in a place where that's less important. But putties also have carriers. And so it's important to look at those carriers and how they behave in the human body.
I just wanted to show a couple of very contrasting patients. This is a very young patient in the upper left part of this slide who has had a spinal cord injury many years prior. He's paralyzed and has this progressive scoliotic collapse, which has led to some pretty severe skin erosions. So his rib cage literally sits on his pelvis and it erodes these big holes. And so in order to keep him sitting upright in a wheelchair and avoid these skin infections um, and quite a few other complications that this was causing for him, he needed a fusion. He was younger, not as healthy as your typical younger patient because of his injuries. But overall, this is a patient who typically is going to fuse for the majority of the time. So I'm not trying to get a perfect correction in this patient. I'm trying to keep him comfortable in a wheelchair, which is very different than trying to balance his spine so he can stand upright and walk with less energy consumption and less pain. So in this patient, I did not do interbody fusions. I did not need to get that perfect correction. So I don't have any potential interbody fusion. So I'm relying solely on the posterior spinal fusion. And we got a decent enough correction to keep his rib cage off of his pelvis. He did very, very well, but you can see in the bottom right, that image there, just some posterior pedicle screws and rods, not overly done, and then bone grafted heavily with biologics. In this case, these were synthetics, strip format placed along the um, lamina in his case, because I did not need to do a laminectomy. One of the problems we see when we do laminectomies and long constructs is it's, in my opinion, easier to get a interlaminar fusion at the midline is to get an intertransverse fusion out lateral. So while we might try to bone graft both areas and do things, to, you know, whatever the surgeon feels is appropriate to get his fusion or her fusion, what's very important is that you think about the process and you choose a graft that's going to be appropriate. And in my hands, a strip synthetic allograft is, uh, is a very powerful tool in this type of a situation. And I don't have to go overboard because this younger patient's likely going to fuse. Patients with spinal cord injuries and traumatic events sometimes fuse better than the average patient uh, due to their injuries. The next patient, this is a very different contrasting patient. So here's a patient with a deformity that needs to be corrected. She's kyphotic, she's scoliotic, she's rotated, not terribly rotated, but enough that it's concern. And so in this situation, we'll review multiple x-rays, talk to the patient, decide what our goals are. And because this patient had no spinal cord injury, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do some inner bodies. It's older patient. So bone quality is probably not as good. Um, I'm going to need a little bit more power uh, in my graft materials to get this patient fused. And I'm going to do a little bit more surgery to try to get this patient fused in a stable manner. So what we did here is a long construct scoliosis and kyphosis deformity surgery. I went laterally initially and placed 3D printed titanium cages in the inner body space. Those allow for its titanium. So it participates in my fusion. It allows me to contain allograft. So a putty would be a good choice in this situation. It's going to help contain by the cage and the inner body space. And then again, the titanium participates and I've got large, large surface areas for uh, the bone to heal. And I've got a lot of cancellous bone as well because the cancellous bone is in the vertebral body. And then when you go and look at the posterior aspect of this fusion, now I'm doing an interlaminar fusion. This particular patient, I did not have to do a laminectomy. So I did not have to jump from an interlaminar fusion out to a lateral fusion, to a transverse process fusion. If you have to do that, that adds another potential site of pseudarthrosis. So in this situation, we did inner bodies. We used a different graft in the inner body space, which was the putty. We use strip allograft in the posterior space because it stays put much better. Okay, so in summary, the argument that I'd like to make is that um, we need to be our patient's advocate. This is very, very important. Our patients are provided informed consent by us, but we don't even understand all of the informed consent issues as spine surgeons, in my case, practicing for 20 years post-training. So it's really difficult to inform your patient adequately, but it's important to be their advocate. Inform them as much as you can, but um, keep in mind that you're there to provide services to the patient. Decisions on bone grafting are very patient specific and very procedure specific. 
You want to choose a bone graft that's appropriate for the patient, it's appropriate for the procedure, and it's appropriate for the location you're placing it. As surgeons, our primary concern should always be the patient. We need to be their advocate. And that puts us at odds oftentimes with hospitals who have a 90-day outlook on outcomes, insurance companies who might have a one-year outlook on outcomes, and us as surgeons and patients who have a lifelong outlook for our outcomes. So we cannot focus on short-term costs. We have to push back against insurance companies and hospitals and explain this to them as often as we can so that eventually they understand what our concern is about bone grafting and bone graft products. Again, in summary, my bone graft decisions are primarily focused on synthetics for all the reasons we've outlined earlier. So I like synthetics. I like putties in the inner body space. I like strips in the posterior gutters and in the inner laminar space. Um, I add autograft as it's available to me without harvesting from a remote site. And I use cadaver allograft type bone when I know it's been processed appropriately. And I add to it if needed, if it's been over processed and has no endogenous factors that will help with my angiogenesis or osteoinductive abilities. So lots of things to think about in each patient. One of the most frequently asked questions that I get about grafting is how we get it approved in a hospital setting. And while that doesn't sound like a very patient specific issue, it really is because some of these decisions are taken out of our hands and they're made by hospitals who decide which grafts they're going to allow, which grafts are gonna be willing to pay for and so it's very important to have actually a role in your hospital or a relationship in your hospital with the decision makers. That might be the CFO. It might be important to sit down with your CFO and say, hey, look, I know this is more expensive, but this patient needs it. We need to take the time and be willing to do that. Um, I think if you do that in a kind but effective way, you'll get a better response than if we go in there and have tantrums, which is oftentimes what many of us do as surgeons. Um, which is unfortunate, but um, I think if you go to your administration and explain to them in a patient-specific manner why you need something extra on a particular patient, why they need to allow a particular product into their hospital and explain it in scientific terms that are easily understood by everyone, basically at the patient level, uh, you can affect change at the local hospital level. And then you should also participate on any insurance boards uh, and so forth that make these decisions as well. Please have your voice heard and let insurance companies and hospitals know and let your patients know. One of the most effective ways to get something approved is to have a patient call their insurance company directly and speak to uh, the insurance company and have a push from an employer as well. So if the patient pushes, the employer paying for the insurance pushes, and the physician is pushing, oftentimes hospital insurance companies will back down a bit. It requires a lot more effort on our part, but it, in my opinion, is worth it to help our patients. And then I just have one more slide. This is me on the left before I start a deformity case and me on the right after one of these deformity cases. They can be very exhausting. Um, they can take many hours to do. And so we really, really want to do them right for our patients on the first go round so we don't put our patients through this big horrible procedure more than once. So please be your patient's advocate.